けどグッドハブエリワンイン・サンディスクール・ディス・モーニング・ウィー・アー・イン・ウィーク・トゥ・イン・アー・シリーズ・アー・バウト・バイスカイ・ディ・レザレクション・イン・ディス・ウィーク・ウォー・ロックン・アー・イースター・イン・ディ・パス・オーバー・ディス・イン・ノー・ゴン・ビー・アー・ディ・タイル・コーチュー・アナリシス・オブ・ディ・ハー・オブ・ディ・アー・ディ・パス・オーバー・フェスティバル・ジュディアズム・ホールズ・トゥ・デイ・オー・ヘル・ヒストリカリー・アー・ロット・オブ・アー・ディ・アー・ディ・アー・コーチュー・アー・フィンズ・ディ・ドゥ・ウィー・The Passover today in、uh, Judaism is not stuff in the Bible, it's just stuff they accumulated over centuries. They do these different rituals and things, and they have stuff they do. And,、uh, so, we're not really going to go over that in detail today. What we're going to look at is what the Bible has to say about it. Turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, and、uh, there's a number of verses I'd like to read here. I'd like to get some volunteers to read some verses for me. Let's see.、Um, let's see. Lee, could you read chapter 12, verses 1 through 6? And then,、uh, good morning, Madison. They already ran next door for you. Morning, Jordan. All right. And、uh, let's see. Anthony, could you be ready to read a few verses for me? Could you read、uh, verses 7 through 10? Be ready to read that.、Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And then,、uh, Al, could you be ready to read verses,、uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 11 through 17 for me? And、uh, go ahead, Lee, and、uh, if you would read your selection. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month, day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to, unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall take your, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And、uh, Anthony, go ahead and read yours, please. Okay. And I shall take, the, take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the, and with the fruit in it sterile. And ye sh- let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which, which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Al, could you read、uh, your part 11 through 17 for me? <clears throat> and thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye, where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, <coughs> that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, 
and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation. Uh, to you no manner of wor work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only that only may be done for you, of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Okay, here we have the uh, Passover described, and we'll read some more of the verses uh, following in just a bit. But uh, basically this first Passover um, was held, historically speaking, April 14th, 1491 B.C., uh, according to uh, Usher's chronology. And interestingly, just uh, concerning Passover, you will also find the term the Feast of Unleavened Bread used throughout the Bible. Um, both terms are used to refer to the Passover. In general, in the Old Testament, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the term used, although the term the Passover is used also. In the uh, Gospels, both are used, but uh, Passover is especially used in um, Mark and Luke, although it says the Passover came, which is called also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's just kind of an interesting uh, extra tidbit there, but both terms are used in the Bible, so just as you read through, understand that. But uh, the reason I give you the date, the historical date there, is um, it's important for us to have ingrained in our mind that the Bible is a historical fact, that the things which happened in it really happened, that they're not... Um, you know, some kind of uh, myth or legend, we believe, or inspiring tales, but it's something which really happened, and uh, had we stumbled in our way into Egypt at that time, we could have been there, had we, uh, you know, been around back then. We were not, however, but we do have the record here for us, and uh, this record is true, as the Bible says. Good morning, Charlie. How are you? Good. Um, let's see. Uh, basically... The uh, Passover here, the people basically were supposed to take a lamb, and they were supposed to kill the lamb, put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, on the lentil of the door, and uh, basically they were then supposed to take that lamb and roast it. It could be a lamb of the goats or a lamb of the sheep. And uh, they took that lamb, and they took a hyssop little brush, and they brush it on the doorposts. That I think it describes that a little bit later in the, in the passage. And... Um, they were supposed to eat that lamb with bitter herbs and with uh, with um, uh, unleavened bread. Now, I looked up about bitter herbs. I guess it was horseradish, maybe, people think. It might have been. And maybe some other things. I didn't think they sounded all that unpalatable. I actually kind of like such things, but um, horsey sauce, honey. I ate Passover food before. You didn't like it? Um, back when I worked at Boca Community Hospital, they would sometimes have, because, you know, there's a very large Jewish population up there, they would sometimes have uh, kosher meals, extra left over. I didn't really like them much. They were pretty flavorless. But um, there was no command for it to be flavorless, just bitter. Anyway, um, so they were supposed to eat it. And it was kind of a very solemn thing because while all this was happening, the destroying angel went through and smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. Anybody who didn't have the blood on their doorposts, their firstborn was smitten. From the uh, Basically, it says from the firstborn who was down in the dungeons up to uh, the firstborn in the very highest castle, everybody was smitten. And uh, <coughs> it talks about, uh, if you recall, how <coughs> they were to eat the feast with their uh, loins girded, with their staff in, uh, standing and ready. Basically, they were supposed to be ready. And uh, they're, the symbol is they're exiting out of the land of Egypt. And uh, the Passover very much pictures the death of Jesus on our behalf to deliver us from sin. Uh, we're spared from judgment because the blood of Jesus is on us. And just like uh, the people in each of those houses, they were spared from the destroying angel because the blood of that lamb was on the house just like God had commanded them. Was it an angel yes. or was it God himself? Um... It's not really clear, I don't think. Uh, some people say one, some people say the other. And uh, basically, uh, I haven't really come to a conclusion on it. And 
if it was an angel doing it, in effect, it was God smiting them anyway. So, um, interesting question, though. Um, let's see, Charlie, can I get you to read Exodus twelve eighteen through uh, eighteen through twenty four? First month on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For leaven, or excuse me, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, uh, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Uh, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitation shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the fats over. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts <coughs> with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Uh, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over uh, the door, and will not suffer the destroyer to come <coughs> unto you unto your house to smite you. And you shall observe this thing from for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye shall become to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. Um, when we read elsewhere in the scripture about this, we, were, we find that basically God instituted every year, um, basically there was to be a Passover. And... Uh, Every year they would offer this lamb, and um, every year also on the Day of Atonement, which would be later, um, I believe the Day of Atonement falls in September usually. Um, it's uh, Yom Kippur is September, right? I can't keep you in that straight. It, actually, sometimes I think it might be in October. Um, an interesting thing to follow with the Passover to understand is the Jews of this time followed a uh, lunar calendar. And sometimes, based on when they thought they needed to, they would put an extra month in the lunar calendar. And it's very complicated about when they would do that. But uh, that's why Easter is on different days each year, is because uh, it, it shadows the Passover, and the Passover is on a different day each year because of the lunar calendar. Anyway, uh, yearly uh, on the Day of Atonement also, the priest would offer the blood... Uh, a Passover lamb, that's a slight mistake in my notes there, to atone for the people. Basically, that's also on the year of atonement, it should say. That's not the Passover lamb, it's a different thing. But uh, anyway, the Passover celebration in years to follow was to remind the next generation that God had delivered them. That's what it says uh, here in verses 26 and 27. When your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? And you shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Egypt, Israel and Egypt. Um, the whole purpose behind this was that so that the people of Israel would remember what God had done for them and how he delivered them. Uh, throughout the Bible, Egypt uh, is often kind of refers to or is used as a symbol of sin or of the world, it seems. Often uh, when someone goes down in Egypt, not always, but often they're going down in uh, for the wrong reasons, and they're getting into trouble, um, like Abraham seemed to have. And um, also when the people of Israel wanted to go back into Egypt, God had delivered them out from Egypt here, and they were commanded to remember this, to remember everything God had done for them. Throughout um, the other books of the law, the commands, especially in Deuteronomy, they're commanded, uh, do not forget what God has done for you. Um, do not forget everything God has done for you because when you do, uh, you're going to fall into sin, your children will fall into idolatry, and if they don't come back, what's going to happen is you're going to be sent into captivity and judged. 
It's very important, a lesson for us Christians today to draw from this, it is very important for us to teach our kids to grow in Christ, uh, to take, teach them to uh, become the kind of Christians they're supposed to be, um, so that way they don't forget the great works of the Lord, and that way they don't stray from him. Now concerning unleavened bread, it, it's interesting about how it's stressed about the unleavened bread, about how even the uh, Passover itself is referred to often as the feast of unleavened bread. Um, someone go ahead and shout out for me. What are the main ingredients of bread? So, uh, well, yeast, flour. Yeast. Yeast. Flour, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeast. Yeast. Water. 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 Salt. 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 Sugar. Some people put sugar in. Sugar, finally. Sugar, yes. That's pretty much it, yes. Um, now, the, uh, if you make bread without yeast, it's, it's kind of a very strange thing. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's very flat. Usually also you put oil in it, or butter, usually butter. Um, that helps it considerably if you put butter in it. And eggs too, that helps it a lot. But uh, the yeast in the bread basically is what makes it a whole lot more palatable to eat. Unleavened bread is, uh, isn't really too good, in my opinion. Now those little matzos, uh, especially those matzo crackers are actually pretty good. I kind of like those. But um, unleavened bread itself, like if you made bread, the what? A little horseradish on them. <laughs> yeah, actually that would be quite good. I think they were getting it pretty good here. But, uh, um, but like unleavened bread, like if you just made bread and did not put it in, it's very heavy. It's, it's, it just doesn't taste too good. It's kind of rough. It doesn't settle in your stomach too well either. I've tried it. Um, anyway... <laughs> So, the uh, leaven in bread is what makes it good, but leaven in, throughout the Bible seems to represent sin, and uh, basically it makes the bread rise, but interestingly enough also, the way yeast makes bread rise is as yeast multiplies, it puts off two byproducts. It puts off carbon dioxide, and it puts off uh, ethanol, <coughs> alcohol. Now, when it rises in bread and you bake the bread, it boils all the alcohol out of the bread, because alcohol boils at 180 degrees. So you can't really make alcoholic bread. Um, but um, the people were commanded, now that'd be terrible, Michael. The people were commanded to put all the leaven out of their houses during Passover week. Michael, I'm glad you're here. You make Sunday school interesting. Um, uh, and interestingly, it kind of developed into kind of a game that people would... Uh, make this big, long, uh, thorough search of all their house, and the parents would hide little bits of leavened bread here and there in the house for the kids to find and things. And so they make it quite a detailed event. Like, what? It's more fun than an Easter egg hunt. Much more fun than an Easter egg hunt, and a little more biblical, too. Anyway, um, so they'd uh, make sure all the leaven was out of the house. And the thing was, is if... Uh, basically, as you remember, we read in this passage, if somebody was to uh, eat unleavened bread or, or eat leavened bread during this time, they were supposed to be cut off from the nation of Israel. They'd become an exile. So this was very serious to God. It's interesting. Uh, yeast is also what causes new wine to become alcoholic wine. That is strong drink. Yeast is a corrupting agent, if you will. And this is how we know absolutely beyond any shadow of a doubt that there was that, that the Lord's Supper was not alcoholic wine. Now, it's possible that some of the Jews around that era would have used alcoholic wine in their Passover celebration. Maybe they did. And uh, Jesus would not have done so. One, Jesus would have obeyed the command, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And in uh, Proverbs 23, look not thou on the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Jesus would not have drunk wine. And two, there is no way Jesus would have had uh, something corrupting, which represents sin, in the, uh, in the um, cup at the Lord's Supper. We'll see that in just a second down below. But the idea behind unleavened bread is basically they're getting rid of the sin. And this unleavened bread uh, very much was a symbol of them partaking of the covenant of Israel. Um, it's interesting, we find elsewhere in the Bible it talks about when the stranger who is among them could partake of the Passover also. 
He just uh, had to be clean, just like the people of Israel. He couldn't have like touched a dead body and these sort of things. <coughs> but uh, people could partake of the Passover anyone because God wanted uh, people to be one unto him. Now concerning the Passover and the Lord's Supper, it's interesting we find throughout the Gospels that uh, Jesus kept the Passover. Now the book of John does not mention the Lord's Supper in particular. Um, it doesn't have the passage where Jesus tells them, this cup is the New Testament, my blood is to you often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It does not have that passage in the book of John, but uh, in the other three Gospels, uh, it does mention that, but it does mention Jesus keeping the feast of the Passover elsewhere in John. However, the uh, Last Supper was the final Passover celebration which God honored. Christ is now our Passover. We'll see that in a passage in a little bit to come. Uh, Jesus fulfilled all the law for us. Um, as it says in, um, in uh, Colossians, about how... Um, it says he blotting out the uh, handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross and it goes on to describe about those things and it says the conclusion was in the book of Colossians let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath day which are shadows of things to come but the body is of Christ the old ways of uh of the Mosaic law were fulfilled in Christ. And uh, we no longer come to God through these feasts of Passovers or through a... Uh, there is another important feast which followed the feast of the Passover, the uh, Feast of Booths, I think it was. It was uh, 50 days following the Passover is also the feast of, well, you could call it the Pentecost. Yes? Was, was that, from what I read, it was that basically a camp out because they just were the booths were tents weren't they just not even that they seem to just be like a shanties erected from sticks and things take sticks or palms and four corners and palm branches for a roof and is that right it's like a lean-to or, or like a cheeky hut almost you know something like that no, skin, no skins or anything like that or just to remind them of you know of, of how little they had and god brought them into the i mean it's a lot of things but one of the things is to remember where they came from good question though um where was i the uh the lord's supper did not and must not use alcoholic grape juice leaven symbolizes sin um there's no impurity in the blood of jesus the the lord's supper basically the uh the, the uh, unleavened bread and the lord's supper represents the uh, body of christ broken on our behalf and uh the uh the uh, the cup, if you will, as it's described in the Gospels, it it represents the blood of Christ. And to say the blood of Christ is an impure thing, is an unholy thing, is very blasphemous against God. And um, Christians can unfortunately do that when they live in a way which is very unpleasing to God and choose to do things their way instead of God's way. We find uh, Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire before the Lord were burned up. And uh, Ananias and Sapphira, when they tried to uh, lie about the things of God, they got stricken. Thankfully for us, God is merciful to us when we do foolishly, but we should be careful about the things of God to keep them holy and to do them the way God wants them to be done. Um, now, concerning the Lord's Supper, belie believers are to celebrate the Lord's Supper as oft as they will in, uh, in remembrance of Jesus' death for our sins. It's a time of putting away of leaven if you will, of sin from our hearts and lives and rededication to Jesus, unlike the Passover, which happened every year, what day did it happen? Depending on the calendar. On, in their calendar. Every day, what, what, what day of which month? First day of the year. Fourteenth day of the year. Fourteenth day of the first month in their religious calendar. Fourteenth day of Abib, as it says in Exodus. But, um... April. Yes, in general. Yeah, April-ish, or March. Um, but, where was I? Um, oh yes, it, believers should celebrate it as often as they will because the uh, Lord's Supper is a thing which is very important for us to remember and um, it's very helpful to remember perhaps more than just once a year. 
Now concerning Jesus, our Passover, Jesus is the lamb that was slain for our sins. The book of Revelation describes him as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Turn please to uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, start at 52.13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and, and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So it goes on to start to ex explain about Jesus, who would come to die for our sins here says basically about how he was uh, his he would be exalted and very high but then it goes on to describe how that would be it's interesting uh, Jesus said and when I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me and his way in which he was lifted up is by dying on the cross it says his visage was so marred more than any man his form more than the sons of men so Jesus was so disfigured by the crucifixion and the things associated with it, um, he didn't even look human anymore. It was so bad. And it goes on to explain, though, about how in general, Jesus wasn't some special person who everybody thought was the greatest thing ever and wanted to follow because he had this charisma about him and this uh, fancy personality and good looks. That's going to be the Antichrist. He's going to be someone coming out of nowhere and... Uh, is going to look great. And if anyone's thinking Vladimir Putin's going to be the Antichrist, he can't. He has a funny-looking nose. Um, it's definitely not going to be him. Anyway, uh, but I just figured I'd see if everyone was awake still or not. Um, anyway, the goes on to describe about him that people didn't receive Jesus. And it's, uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It goes on to say this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Just like the Passover lamb, which was innocent, died for the, the house it was sacrificed for, Jesus was sacrificed on our behalf. We were the straying sheep. We were the ones who should have been executed, but he was the one who was punished in our place. He carried our sorrows, and uh, we esteemed that he deserved to, if you will. But instead, he was wounded for our transgressions. And uh, he was the one, however, who was spotless and was perfect. When a person realizes that he was the one who should have died on the cross, not Christ, but is is, uh, receives that Christ died for him, that's when they receive salvation, when they change from this proud heart it describes here to a heart which uh, will receive God. And it goes on to talk about he was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he opened his not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. It's interesting, it talks about him being stricken, about being killed here. It says in the next verse, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. This is interesting, he died with the uh, two thieves, but yet was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the very rich man. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, and when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's interesting, it talks about him dying, but it talks about him rising again here. 
<clears throat> Definitely he's dying from all these things it says here, but it says, he shall see his seed, that is, you know, his children, the pres he shall prolong his days, the pre pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So basically this talks about the resurrection here. I've read uh, basically liberal scholars say the New Old Testament never talks about a resurrection. That's clearly not true. And there's a number of people in the Old Testament who believed in a resurrection, who spoke of the resurrection clearly, Job being one, David being one in the book of Psalms, and many others, and uh, Samuel even. So it's clearly not true here, and it clearly talks about a Christ who is dying for sins and is rising again here. He shall see of the travail of his soul and be, shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Jesus is a sacrifice which satisfies the wrath of God on our behalf. The uh, blood of bulls and of goats could not take away sins, the book of Hebrews said. They uh, basically pointed of something which was to come, but the blood of Christ does take away sins. Did not need to be offered yearly, but once for all. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Um, the thing we really should take away from this passage is Jesus died for us. We deserve to be the one who received all these things, but he died on our behalf. And that's kind of really the point of the Passover, is that Jesus died on our behalf. And that's the thing we should learn from it and take away from it. We find about this, uh, Jesus is the priest of a better testament. We find further about this in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 through 27. The book of Hebrews was written to Jews, and they would have been very familiar with this concept of the Passover and things and all the sacrifices and such. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 through 27. The Bible says this, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Um, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up the sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So this Passover lamb they would offer yearly. Every day also throughout the year, morning and evening, they were supposed to offer a sacrifice. They had peace offerings they had to offer, and they had um, sin offerings, and they had all these offerings. And uh, they had the great day of atonement they had to offer offerings on. They had all these offerings and things. Christ, once for all, offered himself on our behalf. And uh, he, it says, ever lives to make intercession for us. And because of that, he is able to save us to the uttermost. And that's a pretty exciting thing to think about. We're completely saved, the moment of salvation, completely forever saved and saved to the uttermost. And that's an exciting thing to think about, the security you have in Christ, no matter what. He paid for your sins. He loves you. He paid for your sins, and you are safe and secure in Him. Um, about the offering for our sins, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So this Passover spoke of better things to come. It was a shadow of things to come. And uh, here we have these things to come described. This is Jesus. He died once for all our sins. And uh, he, he uh, as it says here now, is sitting down in heaven, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. That's coming in the future. Jesus died, he rose again, he's coming again. And when he comes, he's going to put down all enemies. The last enemy he's going to put down is death. We'll see about that next week in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
One sacrifice for sins forever. We don't need any works. They can't pay for our sins. We don't need any... Uh, we can't keep the law. The Jews of the Old Testament, they couldn't keep the law. Moses couldn't even keep the law. Even the great man Moses himself could not keep the law and transgress the law. So we have no hope either. But because of this, Jesus once for all, one sacrifice paid for all our sins on the cross. Um, concerning this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see about Christ our Passover and how we ought to live in light of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 7 through 8. Well, we'll read verse 6 too. The Bible says this, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that it may that ye may be a new lump, as ye are lev unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and and truth. Uh, we'll see uh, our final lesson in this series is going to go in detail about how we ought to live in light of the fact that Christ is risen. But from this, something important for us to take away today is that because Jesus died for our sins, we, need to, we no longer need to live in those sins. Amen. Purge them out. Get rid of them, the Bible says. Um, just like the people were supposed to go through their house and get rid of all the leaven, Go through your heart, go through your life, and get rid of all the sin in it. You don't need to live any longer in it because Christ, your Passover, sacrificed for you. And uh, because of that, uh, you don't need to have a sin in your life anymore. The Bible says there, uh, a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. Um, if I recall correctly, when I'd make bread, it was a fairly large recipe, but I'd use, uh, I believe, about eight cups of flour or so. It, it was large bread. There were lots of little Callahans to feed, and they had to be fed by it. Eight cups of flour, like three or four eggs, a stick or two of butter, um, an unspeakable amount of sugar. I actually got to where I didn't measure things. I just threw them in the pan, and it came out pretty well, or at least eatably well. Anyway, um, compared to all those ingredients, the uh, yeast was about a tablespoon. That's about all the yeast we used, just a little bit comparatively. I don't know, by volume, maybe 1% or less, just a tiny bit. Sin defiles Christians. When you let sin in your life, it will get in there and it will grow just like yeast grows. It starts small, it grows, it multiplies, and uh, until it leavens the whole lump, until the whole thing becomes taken over by sin. So that's important for us to understand is that uh, if we let sin in our lives, it'll destroy us. We don't need to walk in the oldness of sins, but in newness of life, it says in sincerity and in truth. Another conclusion we come to from this is because Christ is our Passover, we no longer need to keep the old Hebrew traditions. Uh, there are some Christians today who think that they need to revive all the old Hebrew traditions, and um, you know they think they need to keep the different feasts and stuff. And um, those things are done away with. Christ is our Passover, and uh, those things couldn't put away sins anyway. They didn't work for them, and they won't work for us. The point of the Christ being our Passover is we're supposed to walk in unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him also in spirit and in truth. Uh, God doesn't want, if you will, just a bunch of fleshly actions. He wants obedience, and he wants a heart surrendered unto him. Uh, we celebrate Easter to remember what Jesus has done for us. It is not the Passover. Understand that Easter is not the Passover. It's an important commemoration to, to remind the generation to come of the death of Jesus on our behalf. And so it's important when you celebrate Easter to teach your kids about it. It talks about in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Um, actually, that's it's uh, verse 7 and, and down, actually. It talks about when teaching your kids when you rise up, when you go to bed, uh, throughout the day, teach your kids to know God. And... Uh, Easter is a very useful, um, if you will, way you can teach your kids to know about Christ. And it's an opportunity we can use to teach the lost about Christ, too. It's on our calendar, so it's something we can uh, use and they'll be familiar with to help them know that Jesus died for their sins and they can be saved, too. Next week, we're going to look about the resurrection and uh, 
our being resurrected also, the hope we have in Christ because of it, and the victory which comes because of the resurrection. It's a very exciting chapter we'll be going through. Uh, the chapter is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the most exciting chapters in the whole Bible. And um, I'm excited about it. Hope you are too. We'll go ahead and pray and be dismissed. Dear God, please be with us in the morning service to come. And uh, work in our hearts and help us to be uh, excited about your word. And teach us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.